Well, though I have been your pastor now for nearly 10 years, I think many of you know that Greg and I moved to Saugatuck 18 years ago. And we came here because we bought a bed and breakfast on the hill in Saugatuck. Uh, and at that time that we were first getting started, we became aware of another bed and breakfast in West Michigan that was embroiled in a bit of controversy at the time. A couple had reserved a room in advance at the bed and breakfast, but when they showed up, the, the bed and breakfast owner told them they could not stay there. And she said to them, I see now that you are two men, and ours is a Christian B&B, &B, and I cannot allow you to stay in a bed together. Now, the woman had every legal right to deny them service. There wasn't anything the men could do legally, but they posted about their experience online. And the woman commented, the B&B &B owner, and she said, I will be praying for you. And as I read that, I wondered what that meant. I wondered what her prayer was. Was she at her bedside going, God, please make these two guys not be gay. God, please don't let them love each other anymore. God, please change their hearts and minds. But is that the purpose of prayer? Is the purpose of prayer to change other people's hearts and minds? Or is the purpose of prayer to change our hearts and minds? Now, I share that story with you because, as we heard in today's gospel reading for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, Jesus gives that line, all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, we're reading from Matthew's gospel, but this same exact line, word for word, also appears in Luke's gospel after Jesus tells one of his parables, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So people go into the temple, and the Pharisee prays out loud. You know, he wants to be seen. So he looks up, God, thank you so much, he says, for not making me like these other people, sinners. He said, I fast twice a week and I give my salary as a tithe to the temple. Okay, very showy. But then we see a tax collector at prayer, just someone in the corner, and he's not looking up, he's looking down. And his prayer is, God, have mercy on me. Transform my heart and mind. So one is a prayer of self-righteousness, and the other is a prayer of humility. So another modern example might be a woman who says, I cannot go to my brother's wedding. I am a good Christian woman, and, and he's marrying a man. I cannot support that. And she prays, God, please change my brother. Or let's say there's a good Christian couple whose child is transgender, and they say, you cannot be in this household. We disown you. Get out. Okay. And they pray, God, please change my child. But the prayer of humility isn't about changing others. The prayer of humility is, God, change me transform my heart and mind about this matter, this situation, this person. That's what prayer is. Now, in Jesus' parable, the Pharisee, you may say, who are the Pharisees? Who were they? Well, the Pharisees were the holy people. They were the people who were the people who knew Scripture backwards and forwards. They could quote Scripture chapter and verse. They were considered the upstanding citizens. Tax collectors, on the other hand, they were considered low lives, the scum of the earth. And what Jesus did in that parable was so amazing. He actually made the Pharisee the bad guy in the story and the tax collector the hero. As Jesus did in a lot of his stories, he flipped the script. And that's his point. You know, if you read the Gospels, the teachings of Jesus,
Jesus, in 95% of them, he criticizes the righteous, the holy, the Pharisees, the people who were considered the upstanding citizens. 95% of his criticisms are for them. Jesus called those righteous, self-righteous people the hypocrites. And yet what's so amazing to me is so many Christians in America today, they wear their righteousness as a badge of honor. And they equate righteousness with being right. They say, I have the answer. We found the answer, not just for us, but for everybody. And that's not righteousness. That's arrogance. Can you imagine how arrogant it is to say to the world's half a billion Buddhists, to the world's one billion Hindus, and to the world's 1.6 billion Muslims, you're all wrong. I have the answer. I'm following the right way. You're all wrong. I'm saved. You're not. That's arrogance. Jesus tells a story in Luke 15 about 99 people who are so certain of their righteousness. And Jesus says they're all wrong. For he says true wisdom comes not from certainty, but from humility. True wisdom comes not from certainty, but from humility. I shared with you last year a quote from the contemporary Christian writer Anne Lamott. And she said something similar. She said, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith, she said, is certainty. When you are so certain, you have the answer. You're right. They're wrong. That's the opposite of faith. So then what does it mean then when we read in the Bible about righteousness? When it tells us to, to hunger and to thirst for righteousness, to follow the path of righteousness. What does that mean? Well, as I mentioned at the top of the service when we were honoring Leslie, the Buddhist monk, I learned so much about the path of righteousness from the Buddhists. The Tao Te Ching, which was written by Lao Tzu centuries before Jesus ever lived, talked about the path of righteousness. They call it Dharma. And what it means is the path of right thinking. And what right thinking means is we are to expand our thinking, to question our beliefs, to look at things from different perspectives. In our scripture, in Romans 12, it tells us, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, of your thinking. And that path of right thinking the fruits of it will be peace. The prophet Isaiah says in scripture, the path of righteousness will lead to peace. So that's what I want to say to these Christians who deny service to somebody, uh, a bed and breakfast owner. I want to say to the, the, the woman who won't go to her brother's wedding or the parents who disown their, their child, is the path of your righteousness leading to peace? Is there peace in your community and in your family? The path of righteousness should lead to peace. Madeline La Engel, who wrote A Wrinkle in Time, she said, we will lead others to Christ, not by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are. Rather, she said, we lead people to Christ by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their heart to know the source of it. That's what we as Christians are called to do. Not to go tell people of other faiths that they're wrong, 
not to tell people who have a different lifestyle that they're wrong. Our purpose for being Christians is to shine a light into the world, a light of love, peace, and joy that's so lovely that everyone wants to know what the source of it is. So that's what I'd like to invite you to do this week. That's your homework. Jesus said that you are the light of the world. So go forth this week and be that light. Be that instrument of peace in your family, in your community, and in the world. For when we do as Jesus did, when we love people unconditionally, forgive people instantly, serve the least of these in our midst, we begin to love people more dearly. We begin to see them more clearly. And we begin to follow in the footsteps of Jesus more nearly. Namaste. Namaste. Hello, everybody. This is Sal Sapienza, and I'm so excited to share with all of you that I've written a brand new book. The book is called Childish Thinking, How the Church Keeps Us Stuck in Sunday School. Now, the title Childish Thinking comes from Christian scripture, where we hear that if we wish to grow in spiritual understanding, then we must let go of childish ways of thinking. And yet so many Christians today, even after years of Bible study and Sunday services, still have a very elementary understanding of their faith. They still understand God as some old man with a long gray beard, they think heaven is a place up in the clouds with pearly gates, that the devil is some red guy with horns and a pitchfork, and that hell is a fiery place below the earth. Those are things that we tell children. None of those descriptions appear anywhere in the Bible. And so in childish thinking, I try to dispel many of those misnomers, and I explore topics such as God, Jesus, heaven, hell, sin, prayer, and resurrection from the higher perspectives of ancient Christian mystics and contemporary progressive theologians. After each chapter, there are prayers for quiet contemplation and questions for personal reflection and journal writing. Come learn how you can let go of old ways of thinking and begin to see things with new eyes. Come and learn how you can finally graduate from Sunday school. The book is available now on Amazon, and you can read the entire introduction at childishthinking.faith.